<laughs> Welcome. So, um, uh, despite what the sign up here says, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my, my name is not Sally Kleinfeld. I'm actually uh, Chris Ewing. Sally was unfortunately injured uh, in picking up her visa for the Brazil conference here and was unable to come. Um, but luckily, we have here with us today myself and, and Carlos de la Guardia. Uh, and the two of us are, are among the team that helped to develop this product. So, uh, we're not completely ignorant stand ins. We, we actually do have some clues about how this works. Um, so the talk that we're giving today, or the talk is, is, is about Plone for Education uh, and using Plone within an education setting, but it's more than that. It's about specifically the, the use case of bibliographies, which are quite vital for educational institutions. So to begin with, in general, why is Plone a good solution for education? Uh, the, the, there's a couple of fundamental reasons that make Plone a good fit for educational institutions. The first thing is that it is a secure system. Plone sites, by and large, are subject to far fewer vulnerabilities than other content management systems and have a much better record of repelling attacks than other content management systems. And so universities and educational institutions that don't want to spend a lot of time trying to keep up the security infrastructure of their websites and don't want to have to worry about their websites getting taken over and hacked and eaten up, uh, investing in Plone is a good move. More than that, within institutions that have large numbers of users with diverse roles, Plone's security system and the permission system is extremely robust and allows it to bend and fit whatever the, the use case is that a particular institution has. It's uh, quite able to adapt to any sort of organizational structure and to fit the needs of the people who are running the system. Plone also has a good record with regard to accessibility. It was one of the first content management systems to pay attention to that, and although it fell behind over a short while, there has been a great deal of attention paid over the last year and a half to two years to try and bring it up to code and make it an excellent, excellent uh, citizen within the accessibility world again. That's also important for educational institutions because many of them have governmental obligations to be accessible to users of all stripes. Plone's also scalable. You can serve massive sites off of it or tiny sites off of it. You can serve sites with 10 users. You can serve sites with 100,000 users. It's possible to support structures of all different sizes using Plone. And now that we have the Diazo theming engine, it's entirely possible to set up a Plone site and theme it so that it looks like your institution relatively quickly and in a way that uh, people who don't necessarily understand Python will still be able to actually uh, take care of that task for you. Moreover, folks at institutions can add custom types and workflows to Plone, which make it a really good candidate for imp implementing workflow-based or work, uh, 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 job-oriented tasks. If you have application procedures at your institution, you want to bring in people, you want to have them fill out an application, and then have that application go through a series of steps of workflow of review and, and edit. Plone is an excellent candidate for implementing work workflow applications that are really important with large institutions like uh, uh, schools. Moreover, there are add-ons that are available for Plone that make it a good candidate for education institutions. There's the Active Directory and LDAP integration that means that you can actually integrate your membership with existing systems that work at your institution. We also have the ability to set up subsites uh, that Clayton was talking about in one of the rooms next door just previous to this, and that allows you to create uh, sites that have individual command and control and individual content, but have them all contained within a single site so that you can reduce the amount of management overhead that's necessary in order to provide individual and tailored websites for your, for your schools. Plone comes with calendaring tools, and now that we have Plone App Event coming online, that gives us recurring dates and all kinds of exciting things so that uh, you can actually support the kind of event calendars and news and things like that that uh, educational institutions enjoy. And there's fundraising and contact, uh, contact request management, right? So CRM tools and fundraising tools are available. There's great integration with things like Salesforce that allow you to keep track of your, uh, your contacts over time and to make sure that the funds that you're looking for actually get to you in the most expeditious way possible.
Finally, the faculty staff directory product, which has been around for a while, allows you to integrate user management with content management, allows you to set up users that can then manage their own profiles, manage their own little tiny areas where they have their own uh, ability to create content and manage content. And those people become members. You can give them roles, you can give them abilities, you can give them permissions within the site, and it uh, allows HR to become sort of part of the website management task. And more pertinent to this talk, there are add-ons that support bibliographies. Well, Bibliographies have been available in Plone since about 2005 with the CMF Bibliography AT product. This is a product that's been around for quite some time now. It's available on Plone.org, um, and it's an, an, a good download. With it, you can create and manage bibliographic references. Basically, you can import these references and then manage them within your Plone site. It's a relatively feature-complete product for the niche that it operates in, and it's quite stable. There really hasn't been a whole lot of change in this product over time, which tends to make it look like it might be more abundant, but it's really more that it's just mature. It has been around for a while, it does what it's supposed to do fairly well, and so it's a nice solid product. Now, details of CMF BibAT is that it, it provides a number of different content types that allow you to manage different kinds of bibliographic items. Uh, they are all archetypes-based content types. This is an AT product um, and not a dexterity product. Uh, and it also provides you with special folders to contain those products. So uh, it, it provides you with tools to manage your bibliography as well as with different types that let you represent books or web pages or journal articles or uh, theses from PhD students or master's students, so on and so forth. It allows you to create personal individual lists as well as aggregated lists that spread out across a site. There's duplication de de uh, detection within the system. So if somebody uploads a bibliography for their own area and there's a reference within that bibliography that's a duplication of some other reference in the website somewhere, CMF BibAT is actually capable of detecting that and alerting you to that duplication and pointing you to the alternate resource so you don't end up with six versions of the same book in the same website. The schema for it follows BibTeX, which is a uh, schema that's been set up for bibliographic references within the LaTeX uh, reference management system. It's a pretty solid uh, system and it works quite nicely. And it supports several import and export formats. You can actually import uh, information into CMF Bibliography AT from BibTeX format. You can import it from Medline format. So if you're downloading something from the National Libraries of Medicine or from PubMed or one of these other organizations, you can get that information in. You can also import from EndNote. So if you're somebody who uses EndNote to manage your bibliographies, you can export them from there and import them directly into your Plone site. And the nice thing about these formats and the way that they're implemented is that they're all just Zope utilities. They all work within the ZCA and, and they, they provide a relatively simple interface. So it's quite easy to create new import or export utilities that support whatever format it is that you happen to have for your particular bibliography. Some examples of sites that use this that we've been working on or that have been working on. This, this website has, as you can see, a number of references to publications that are available here. Um, and you can look at these. Oh, the, the, the point of this one is that they're organized by year. If you see over here, there's a number of uh, yearly folders, and each one of those folders has uh, references inside it. Um, let's see here, four particular items. There's a view of an individual item that gives you uh, stuff like the list of the authors that wrote it, the title of it, the uh, reference to the original publication that it came from, abstract information, perhaps any notes that you might have about this. Um, and for this particular thing, because it happens to be published online, there's actually a link here that's generated from the identification information in this reference that will take you online to PubMed and let you see the original paper there. Um, which is quite nice. Um, in this one, we can see there's a slightly different look and feel to this particular uh, bibliography, so it's relatively easy to skin into theme, but it supports pagination and lets you do all sorts of fun and exciting things there. 
Um, and this one at the, the uh, University of Minnesota Press, uh, there's a nice bibliography that has, again, not only decades, but individual years. This particular one supports, what is it, Carlos? Something like 50,000 bibliographic references that have been imported from a, psycho a, a, a database of psychological uh, reference materials. So it's all educational information about uh, uh, psychology, and all of these references have been imported in, and the site still continues to function. So it's really quite robust even over very, very large bibliographies. To What's that? Too nice to import. <laughs> Not too nice to import. It takes quite some time to actually get all that content in, but once it's there, you can actually look at it and interact with it well. You can edit these things, and it, uh, it's got kind of a, a customized interface. There's a, a, a web place for you to input the authors, uh, and you can give first name, last name, information about them, like the, the URLs of their homepages and such. Um, you can also put down information about where the thing comes from, titles, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it works like a normal archetypes content type, but with specialized fields. And those fields can change between different kinds of publication types. There's also a built-in search that comes with this. So within CMF Bibliography AT, there's a, a specific search that allows you to search bibliographic items, and that gives you uh, the ability to, to sort and, and, and filter your search based on different uh, criteria that apply specifically to bibliographic references. So it keeps that information sort of separate from the rest of the site, makes it a little bit easier to find the bibliographic references that you're looking for. But bibliographies are odd. Right? There's a million billion different kinds of styles for bibliographies. When you put down a reference on a piece of paper, everybody wants you to do it differently. If you publish in this journal, they want it formatted in such and such a way. If you publish in that journal, they want it formatted in a completely different way. And this can lead to difficulty because who's in control of how a bibliographic reference looks, right? Underneath, it's all the same information. All we need is information about the title and who wrote it and maybe what journal it was in and page numbers and so on. But presentation actually matters. Different disciplines have different styles that they like. So there's the, the American Psychological Association that has a bibliographic reference that looks like this. Um, or you could look at the computer science and engineering field, which has bibliographic references that might look like that. Uh, MLA, the Modern Library Association, has one that looks like this, and there's many, 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 many more of these, lots of them. So how does CMF BibAT deal with that? Well, in Plone Bibliographies, traditionally, there's another add-on product that goes along with this called products.at biblio styles. This product has been around basically about as long as CMF BibAT has. You can actually see sort of dependencies in the code between the two of them. They are very closely related to each other. But it hasn't been worked on in quite a while. And it adds support for a very limited number of styles. Chicago style, Harvard style, the APA, and the MLA styles, right? If you want to add another style to this, you need to know how to code Python because this is a Python product. So that's what it does. Um, and that can be a problem. Now, when you have installed this product within a site that has CMF BibAT, you then get this little drop-down menu that appears up in the corner here where you can select the style that you want it to appear in. And once you've made a choice, the format of the bibliography will actually shift, and you'll see a different formatting of all that information based on the style that you've selected. So it's quite effective for what it does, but it's kind of limited in what it does. It's not really enough to solve the problem. For serious academic use, having access to only five different styles really is not sufficient. So how do you easily support the hundreds and hundreds of styles that are out there? Well, the approach that we've chosen to take is that this is a problem that all bibliographic tools have to solve, right? Everybody has a bibliographic tool. We all need to solve this problem, so why not work together on this? The answer to this is the Citation Styles Language, or CSL, which is an XML variant that allows you to determine or, or, or uh, uh, declare how a bibliographic reference should appear. There's a website for this. It's called citationstyles.org. If you go to that website, you can read information about uh, how the Citation Styles language works, what the specifications for it are, so on and so forth. But the basic gist of it is that it's, it's an XML syntax that lets you define different bibliographic styles. The nice thing about it is that as a project, they've actually open sourced not only the language and the scheme itself, but also the repositories of styles. So there's a GitHub repository that holds over 6,500 of these styles implemented with titles about what they belong to and how they look and so on and so forth. 
And you can browse and preview these styles at a site called the Zotero Style Repository. And uh, I can give you a little preview of that. So here at the Zotero style library, you can see there's just a, a boatload of these things. I can scroll for a while and I still haven't gotten out of the C's yet, right? So there's, there's a lot of styles. And if you hover over one of these things, you can actually see a set of sort of uh, pre-selected citations reformatted according to their particular style ideas, right? So you can see what the styles look like. You can take a look at them, see how they work. And if you click on one of these things, you can actually go back and see the uh, XML style, that the, the CSL sheet that, that supports this. So this is the uh, citation styles language. Blah, 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 there we are, and we've got the previews. So here's a slide that shows us this. What happens then is that we have processors. Processors take a set of references, and they take one of these style sheets, and they put them together, and what comes out the end is formatted bibliographic references. There's a number of these available. They all start with Citeproc. There's a JavaScript version of it. There's a Haskell version of it, a Ruby version of it, a Java version of it, which is actually just a thin wrapper around the JavaScript one for some odd reason. And there's even a Python version of it, which is kind of nice. Unfortunately, though, the Python version is a bit fluid. There's actually two different implementations. They're both named exactly the same thing Citeproc-Py. One of them is Python 2 and is no longer been worked on. It hasn't been touched in about eight months or so. Uh, the other one is for Python 3 and is under active development, but is really only about 60% complete as compared to the normal site proc uh, uh, implementation. So it's not really ready for prime time yet. Plus, because it's Python 3 and aimed pretty much squarely at that market, it makes it difficult for us to use within the Plone world because Plone is still uh, for Python 2. So SitePROC.js is a JavaScript version of this that is in very wide use. It's actually been used all over the place. It's the right thing that we're going to choose. It's the standard way to add citation styles across a number of different tools at this point. It's used by Zotero, which is a publicly available reference management system. You can download it as a, a plugin for f Firefox. Go to websites, see a, a, a reference, click on the thing, and load it into your Zotero bibliography. And Zotero is powered. The, the presentation layer of it is powered by this this uh, site proc and citation styles. There are add-ons available that support this for Drupal and WordPress. So the, the community in general of open source tools uh, for content management has been moving towards using this. We need to support it as well. Plone needs to get on the train and, and, and do this as well. So before I talk about our specific implementation, I'd like to offer a thanks to our sponsors, the folks who made this possible. The University of Minnesota Press and Dunbarton Oaks, which is a, a repository of, or a, a museum, isn't it, Carlos? And in, in, yeah, a museum in Boston or in the Boston area that is big and beautiful and has, a, no, it's in Washington, D.C., isn't it? Yeah, so Dunbarton Oaks and the University of Minnesota Press have become our sponsors for this. They need to have bibliographic styling available for the large bibliographies that, they, that both of these sites support. And what's more important is that the two of them got together and agreed to pool their resources to help support development of a product that would fill this need. The product that we've come up with is called collection or collective.citationstyles. It's one of the, the millions of products under the collective namespace, down in GitHub. It supports an integration of this specific CSL style sheet into Plone. It allows you to have a control panel. You go to that control panel and you can upload these XML style sheets so that you can get new files and new styles available. Then it allows you to select one of the uploaded style sheets to become the default one for your site. If you don't pick any other, that will become the style that all bibliographic items and lists of them uh, appear in. We're also working on allowing editors to select per context style sheets. So if you have a folder that's a bibliography that's your personal one, you can choose to show it in MLA style, and your buddy who likes Chicago can go and pick that one instead, and somebody else can pick some other style sheet for their things. So editors will be able to select individual ones for the context that their bibliographies live in. 
The actual rendering of these styles then is handled in browser on the client side. It's not done in the website. So the website itself only stores bibliographic references in CMF BibAT. Then that information is sent to the browser and in the browser, this uh, SitePROC.js process transforms those according to the style sheet that you have and displays them to you in the style that you've selected. There's a couple of moving parts involved in making all of this work. The first one of them is an iterator. And basically, this is something that is an adapter that adapts both individual bibliographic content and folders of bibliographic content, both the bibliography folders that are provided with CMF BibAT, but also collections, both the old style and new style collections. So if you make collections of bibliographic items on your site, this thing will be able to adapt that context and see those items. What it does is it looks in its context for things that are, in fact, bibliographic references, and then it provides you an iterator that just walks across these things one at a time. What it gives back to you is a series of iBibliographic reference adapters. So there's an adapter that's created that provides a standardized interface for the information that's available within a bibliographic reference. The nice thing about this is that this adapter at the moment is written for CMF BibAT content. It works well with the CMF BibAT content, but when that content goes away, or if it gets rewritten and upgraded and becomes maybe a dexterity product or something else, we rewrite the adapter or we create a new adapter that adapts the dexterity version and we can still have this product work, right? Everything is based on adapters so you don't have to worry about being so tightly coupled to the original code that you're stuck needing to upgrade everything. And the process of this looks something like this. You just say for reference in iCitation iterator over some particular context. Another moving part that we have is the renderer. Now what this is, is a utility that you can look up. You pass into it one of these bibliographic references that you've just been iterating across. And what it does is it extracts values out of that thing and maps them from the CMF Bibliography AT schema into the CSL schema, the schema that supports this citation styles. And then it returns a Python dictionary of all of that information. So it takes CMF bib content, maps it into the citation styles language, and gives you back a Python dictionary of all of that information. So you can create something that looks like this. Here's a dictionary of all of our references. For each reference in our iterator, we take the rendering utility and we render it out. And then we grab it by ID and we stick it into the dictionary that contains all of them. And what we've got at the end is a big blob, a big dictionary filled up with references where the ID of that thing points to all the information that you need. Finally, we've provided a JSON view that does all of the magic. Basically, this view can be summoned in any context. It builds an iterator, so if there is bibliographic material within that context, it will iterate across it for you and hand them back to you one at a time. It then renders out those references, and it takes everything that it gets in that nice Python dictionary, and it dumps it out as JSON and throws it back at the browser. So, in the end, we end up with a view that looks pretty much something like this, right? We've got a dictionary, we do all this rendering that we just talked about, and then we grab the JSON module from Python and just dump everything out as a JSON string and send that back to the browser. The last thing that we have is a little viewlet. And this viewlet shows up in contexts where you have bibliography stuff. So on bibliographic item, on the bibliographic folders, and soon to be on views that are provided for you for the context of uh, collections and such. And what this thing does is that it loads up the core JavaScript, the engine and the things that the engine needs in order to be able to work. It then configures a rendering engine from that core JavaScript using whatever style sheet happens to be defined as the one for this context. Then it uses that JSON view to call the context there it's in and get back the JSON about all the bibliographic references it can see. And finally, it takes the standard CMF bibliography AT view that it sees and it replaces it, pulls it out, and replaces it with the newly rendered content that came out of this rendering engine. So it's a small viewlet, JavaScript only, that takes all of the content that CMF bibAT gives you empties it out and replaces it with properly formatted references. If you don't have JavaScript, it falls back to just standard CMF BibAT presentation, so you haven't lost anything. If the rendering for some reason breaks 
and it fails to render out any content, you end up with the standard CMF Bib AT presentation and you haven't lost anything. So no matter what, you get a view on your bibliography, but if everything works out the way it's supposed to, you get this nicely rendered view of it, which is really quite good. So some samples of this, if we take a look, Here's a Plone site where we've installed, this is Plone 4.2, 4.3, something like that. We've installed CMF Bib AT. I click on the bibliography folder and you can see that I've actually installed something here and these things are being rendered in some sort of bibliographic style. If I disable JavaScript, uh, let's see. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Um, where is it? Under develop, there it is. Disable JavaScript and reload the page, it goes back to the normal CMF Bib AT view, right? If we turn JavaScript back on and reload, we're back to the formatted view. And if we open up a new tab with our site setup, the control panel here, we wander over to the control panel to our citation styles control panel. Right now, the Modern Language Association 7th edition style is being shown, but let's change that. We can go to, say, the Chicago Manual of Style 16th edition. We save that as our new default, and over here, we can reload our page, and you'll see that the bibliographic references look different. They've reformatted themselves according to the new default style for this particular context. We even have, because this is citation style language, and because it's open source, there are even really interesting sort of <laughs> Brazilian ones that, that I know nothing about. I've never seen this before. I have no idea whether it actually works, but I found it the other day, and I figured I would upload it and see if it actually does something. So let's go back and see what happens. Wahoo! It's Brazilian. <laughs> well, okay, so it's not translated or anything like that, but it's in the proper format for this particular association within Brazil, right? So it's a pretty simple process to actually upload these style sheets, to use them within your website, and to have your bibliograph bi bibliographies reformatted according to the styles that they provide. What's the status of this product? Where are we now? Well, at the moment, it's usable. Right? It's only available in a GitHub repository right now, but it's usable. You can import CSL styles, you can select a default style, it will render individual references, and it will render bibliography folders. So you'll be able to see folders, individual references, so on and so forth. It is not yet feature complete. We need to be able to add default styles so that when you install the product, it comes with one or two style sheets already loaded so it works right out of the box. At the moment, there's nothing in there. So you upload it, you turn it on, and, and, and your bibliographies don't change at all, and you wonder why. We also need to add the editor ability to individually choose appropriate styles for individual bibliographic contexts. And we want to be able to add browser views that will support collections. Right now, that is not working out of the box, but it will. Things we'd like to see within the world of the collective.citation styles would be dynamic style sheet selection for viewers so that individual viewers without editing rights can pick a style that they want to see a bibliography in and have it dynamically reformat right there in their browser. We'd also like to be able to do automatic inline processing of citations. So let's say you upload a paper that you've written and in that paper you select some word and you say this one is a reference to a paper that lives in my bibliography somewhere. I could imagine a tiny MCE plugin that allowed you to select a particular style and say, this is a reference to that particular thing over there. It would place a, a, a footnote, create a footnote at the bottom, and then in line, when it actually renders that page, pull all of the references, create a bibliography for you, and show it at the end of your paper with citations and so on and so forth. It'd be really nice to be able to do that. It would also be nice to be able to just completely replace the existing CMF Bib AT views because, uh, to be perfectly honest, they're getting kind of long in the tooth. Moreover, there's some problems with CMF Bib AT. It's big, it's old-fashioned, and it's complicated. It's built on top of CMF and archetypes, so it's really using technology that we're trying to move away from, and it's not particularly friendly to collections, despite the fact that we can use them with our theming system. It would be very nice to be able to do a major rewrite of CMF Bib AT, perhaps to replace it with some other tool. And so one of the reasons that we implemented this tool the way we did was to be able to decouple it from the actual implementation of what a bibliographic reference is underneath, right? We don't care whether it's CMF Bib AT or some magical product yet to be discovered. 
The way forward, therefore, would be for us to try and find sponsors who might be able to support this work and then to schedule a rewrite sprint to actually make the thing happen. I think this is not a bad idea. It's something that we would like to be able to push forward. And if any of you represent institutions that would be interested in having a new cutting-edge bibliographic tool available for you in Plone, uh, please contact me. We would love to hear about any sources of funding out there. If you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to take them here. I also have an email address and a Twitter handle here for you if you need to get in touch with me offline or after this whole thing is over. Um, and so I'll open up the floor to questions if there are any. And if not, oh, yes, a question, yay! <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a, bibli a, a central bibli bibliography for all German computer scientists mm -hmm. made by another university mm -hmm. and uh, all uh, uh, scientists uh, use this and 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 and, and, and yeah, uh, like PubMed is for the medical yes, world. Yes, I, yeah, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And um, but it it uh, so it, it should be uh, able to use this uh, by bi bibliography also. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, what's another issue is that uh, maybe the document. Uh -huh. He's on, a, on in another site, maybe it as a PDF document, maybe it's locally right. in, in, in our institute or anywhere, but mm -hmm. not in the bibliography. And it should be referenced also. Yeah, in, possible to build references that look yeah. for external content. Yeah. Yeah, content that's not. I agree. I think that would be a very nice thing to do. And that's the, among, I think, the, the, the inability of CMF BibAT to deal with content that isn't resident in Plone is, I think, one of its, one of its drawbacks and something that I think needs to be repaired as well. But yeah. it's, not, it's not possible to do that uh, at the moment with your product. Uh, uh, this product, no, but I could imagine some way in which you might have some kind of a... I mean, the problem is how do you get a hold of that stuff, right? You have to have some importer that does that um, if you want to import it into your site. Otherwise, you need to have some kind of syndication method for, for getting the information. But that's... I mean, I could imagine a way that would make that work. Um, we've, I've, I have personally implemented for another university a PubMed ID importer where it goes out, it does a PubMed query, gets a bunch of IDs, and then imports references to those papers directly into the website automatically. So such things are possible. Assuming there's some identifier that this, that this library provides, it's doable. Um, but this is not what this particular thing is meant to solve yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before I shut this down and pass it on to the next folks? No? Okay. Well, thanks very much for attending. I, I hope you enjoy the next talk.